would like to uh, ask all of you to uh, do a death defying thing, I know, but would you please turn off your cell phones or put them on air like airport uh, mode? I meant to do that. It makes things a lot better to do it that way. Uh, I'm very, very happy to see so many people out here today. Looks like the first day of winter. Uh, <laughs> I uh, think a football game today and this afternoon be much better on television than at Dyke Stadium. Uh, but anyway, so again, welcome to our meeting and let us begin. The agenda is uh, very much as you've seen before. We have a feature presentation from the gentleman from uh, St. Joseph's Hospital. Uh, our finances, again, are very sound. Uh, we're, uh, you know, basically, uh, basically doing very well. Uh, food pantry, again, I'm very proud of the contributions that everyone makes. Uh, I think we're probably one of the larger continuing contrib contributors from Sun City to uh, the Grafton Food Pantry, and I know they're very appreciative of that. <clears throat> Our membership, 1,528, as you know, we start out at the end of the year at about 1,700. Then we dropped to 14, now we're back to 15. That just means more and more computers are breaking. And, uh, <laughs> people are, are, uh, who thought they would gamble on not renewing are coming back. So, uh, But at any rate, uh, we're, we're very proud of that figure, 1,520 people. Uh, again, because of that, we have to remind everyone that please, we you bring your computer and don't bring your neighbors your daughters, your grandkids, whatever. The club's services are basically for the club's members. And uh, we simply don't have the cushion uh, in our repair abilities uh, to absorb any additional uh, machines. We're, we're really, uh, I know some days are not crowded. A lot of days are very crowded though. Uh, also, uh, if you have any topics of general interest for either classes, meetings, uh, whatever, Please contact uh, myself or Frank at the web uh, at the P, uh, club website, and we'll, we we really welcome any information you may have along those lines. Fall classes, uh, they're all listed on the website, and they're listed in more detail, of course, on the website as to what the content is. But this gives you an idea. We've got basically through the month of October. Uh, about eight classes coming up, and uh, as a member, they're free. It's first come, first serve as far as drop in, and uh, we really hope everyone will take advantage of, of those opportunities. Monthly club newsletter. Uh, Jim and Bob have been doing a remarkable job on that. They need help. We all need help. Uh, but. Uh, Please, if you have items for them that belong in the newsletter, you feel, even if you don't have it written up, if you just have a topic, you saw a little clip in the paper or something, send it to them and they can develop it and they can work with it and, <clears throat> and use it uh, in, in the newsletter. We're always looking for information that we can convey to the membership. Community matters. Uh, before I start that, I'm gonna ask Ken to come up Ken's going to be more knowledgeable on this particular community matter than I am, so let him give you a moment or two. Uh, good morning. Um, I, I'm involved with the Huntley Community Radio Station. I'm their, I'm their IT department. Uh, <laughs> um, and just a little update on that. Yesterday at noon, we turned on the transmitter. So it is transmitting on 101.5 FM. Now, it is still in a test mode, and we have to prove to the FCC that we're doing everything proper, and then they will give us the final approval. So we haven't gotten the final approval yet from the FCC, but right now it's on the air. You can turn on your radio and you, on 101.5, and you can listen to it. And there is some, oh, I think there's, they're not really calling it the Sun City Hour, but like from, I think, 1 till 2, there's some music that's more of our era. And, um, <laughs> And, and I think 
they may, may even be including some sensitive announcements. Uh, but um, there's there's a morning uh, news program. There's an evening news program at five o'clock, I think. So it's uh, it's pretty exciting. Uh, it's um, it's happening. It's, it's been kind of a out there. It's been on the internet for two years, so you could have listened to it there, but not too many people want to do that. But now you can just turn on your car radio or anything, and we got really good coverage. We drove around yesterday, and we were um, all the way out to 90, and, and uh, it's low power FM, so it's not going to be like you know, some of your regular radio stations. But we've gone up to Ackman Road and Randall Road, and, and so it's all the general area around here we've got covered. So, uh, give it a listen. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is every one of these meetings, I do record, and it's actually streaming now, live out over the internet. So you could be sitting at home watching this. Um, <clears throat> if you go to the Computer Club webpage on our Sun City website, you can, it's, it's down at the bottom of the uh, Computer Club webpage. There's a, like a YouTube video window. You can click on that and you can watch, uh, I think, uh, I'm pretty sure you can watch the current live stream. Uh, I don't know, I gotta make a change for that. Um, but you can watch any of the past, from January on, um, I'm missing a couple, I gotta put them back. But you can watch any of the videos that I've recorded from January on up till now. So give it a listen, or a watch actually, and uh, um, it's, uh, I forget what I was gonna say. Um, anyway, it, it's, they're out there. You can watch them. There was a problem with August. Dan Ray, when he talked about Windows 8.1, um, there was no audio. I fixed that. There's audio now. So if you tried to listen to it and you couldn't, try it again. It's there. So, all right. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, again, Community Matters. Uh, there will be meetings on Thursday, November 6th. For residents to ask questions about the upcoming budget and their obviously uh, corollary uh, assessment calculations for next year. Uh, the 8 p.m. neighborhoods will be at 10 a.m. And uh, as you all know, the 8 p.m. is a more unique presentation. The neighborhood, the single family resident neighborhood, will be at 2 and at 6. Uh, there'll be a listing put out probably on a blast. Uh, showing which neighborhood should go to which meeting. However, uh, you can go to any, either meeting, you know, depending on your schedule or what have you. But it's a good idea that uh, you, you attend uh, these meetings. You'll get a chance to ask questions about the budget. You'll get to understand it more. And I think the more people understand what's going on and the workings of the community, the better off all of us are because uh, it's far better to get information than feed off rumors. Uh, the next board meeting will be October 22nd. That'll be a quarterly meeting. It'll be here at 1 o'clock. Executive director meet and greet will be the same day in the morning. Uh, the Hundley Public Library is going to be closed for two days, October 14 and 15, for some maintenance work. So you might uh, want to make a note of that. The community is going to have an uh, electronic recycling event. Uh, over in the uh, outlet mall again, as they did this last year or last spring, I forget which it was. Uh, apparently, the, uh, I'm not sure the exact uh, mechanics of this, but they're going to check IDs, so you need your driver's license to get uh, to recycle. Apparently, they had, I'm guessing, a flood of product coming in from all over the world. And uh, they probably end up paying to recycle that product from all over the world. So they are going to check uh, IDs or uh, make sure your address uh, is a Huntley address. So, okay. Another thing that came up that I thought was interesting, I just wanted to pass it on. <clears throat> According to the Federal Trade Commission, the biggest growth in identity theft today is in college students. Probably most of us in this room have grandchildren in college. Uh, it's something to think about and it's something that we probably never talked to them about. Uh, but it's something we might want to point out that uh, 
uh, this could be a real problem for them going forward, and it is a real problem in terms of the degree to which the incidences are being reported. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Schaefer from uh, St. Joe, and he will handle the program, and I'm sure you're going to really enjoy this program. Jeffrey? done to our field. Um, I'm a radiation oncologist and you're going to meet my colleagues as, as they come in behind me. Uh, these, uh, Dr. Uh, Koch will be talking. He's going to talk about radial surgery. Um, he's the medical director. Uh, my specialty is prostate cancer and some of you are my patients. Some of you will be my patients. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, Sandy Brindley is coming right behind us and she is going to uh, tell you about dosimetry and how we do treatment planning. It's all again by the computer. Um, there's been an explosion in our abilities and we're going to try to display that to you today in a, a very abbreviated fashion. Uh, Lori Schottner is, is our director. She is a, our administrator. She's the big cheese. We answer to her. Um, very briefly, I'm a resident here and I've been here for over 10 years. Um, I've been part of the computer club for uh, around five years, I mean nine years, excuse me. I'm from the University of California, Irvine. And I graduated uh, in um, 1970. Uh, around here, I want you to know my name is Jeff. It's not doctor. Uh, the, if you go to the hospital, then um, I go by a doctor if that's what you want. And, uh, uh, I've been doing this for almost 45 years. I still practice medicine. I'm turning 71 and do part-time. Uh, I'm, I'm half-time right now, but uh, we're looking at the future and I know that it's going to end fairly soon. Uh, I had residencies in, um, at the University of California Davis in family practice, radiology back at my home school at UC Irvine, also radiation oncology at the University of Oregon. I couldn't make up my mind and actually it dovetails together very nicely. All of that kind of fits together, uh, but I had this habit of residencies. Um, I was uh, head of a cancer center in Oregon for many years, for about, well I should say for 10 years, and then I've been at St. Joe's for almost 25 years. Uh, we're all part of uh, St. Joe's and uh, we're part of the uh, Meadows uh, uh, Regional Cancer Center. And you're going to find my colleagues are, are, are really wonderful people. I still practice because I enjoy what I do and I have wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, colleagues to work with. Uh, this is a, the problem and I'm not, I'm not going to dwell on this much other than say that cancer is not bad. And you're going to see very, very briefly here that over a million and a half new cancers uh, are expected to be diagnosed this year. You can look at the list right there and you're going to see prostate, breast, lung, and colorectal. I want to say that when I was in medical school and what we expected outcomes to be, they're so different than today because we have really done an amazing job in dealing with cancer. Um, and part of what you're going to see today is, is part of the, those statistics. What we, we use is radiation in all different forms. Uh, we are going to show you a little bit about some of this today. Um, but basically, radiation will damage the nucleus of, of the cell. It kills the, the ability of that cell to live, and then that cancer is going to slough in, in time. Uh, so basically, when I was in medical school, which was back in the middle to late uh, 60s, uh, things were very primitive. Think about what, what, what it was like in the 60s. As you remember, you know, I think we still have the dial 
telephone at that time. Uh, it's basically, that's what we were dealing with in medicine as well. Everything has amazingly uh, changed and the computer has changed the complexion of what we do. Um, from a standpoint, what um, we want to do is we want to produce and we want to deliver radiation to the area, but we want to get as much as we can get in, and but minimize uh, basically the surrounding normal tissue effects. Uh, now we think 3D. When I was in medical school, what we did is we thought 2D. And as you remember, when you had a chest x-ray, you would put your chest up against a cassette that had film in it. Uh, somebody, a technician in back of you would shoot a beam and they would cut to, and, and you would get a film out of that and basically the x-ray was, uh, film was picking up what, we, what was being absorbed and what wasn't being absorbed. Uh, so it was all in 2D form. So when we did our treatment, we had to basically uh, deal with that and we would do kind of, this is just a, it's not really a good film for that, but uh, it was basically we would include all we thought was there. Again, we didn't, couldn't look into the, the body, we just couldn't do that. Uh, so we had to say, okay, here's the, here's the cancer, now here's what we're gonna have to do. We're gonna treat around that. And so what we had to do is put big borders on it. So we treated a lot of normal tissue. And many of you have horror stories of uh, maybe you had radiation or maybe your family did, and you said, man, that was horrible. Or times have changed. So in the night, in the, actually in the um, into the 70s, I can remember when our professor, um, well, I was actually in, in residency in, in radiology, University of California, Irvine, and I remember this talk when they talked about this thing called CAT scanning. That was amazing. Some futuristic idea. And, and that changed as the computer changed, so did, did that whole concept of what we were able to generate in terms of an image changed. Uh, we had the advances in CAT scanning, obviously you know what that is. Then we had MRI, we'll talk very briefly about that. PET scanning, I mean, some of you have heard these things, and of you haven't. Uh, we have now our ability through the computer to deliver our beam in a very focused way, and we use a, a series of, of leaves that move in, uh, according to what we're looking at. We have, as the, the, our gantry is moving around the patient, it can make adjustments as it, it does, as from the standpoint, we, the beam looks at it. If you look at this, this little device I have, depending on what you are, what projection you are seeing that, um, we, our, our ability now is to change what that that, that the, what the computer does with that is change of a beam um, configuration based on what it's going to look like to that to that um, whatever the beam's eye view is at that point. It's, so that's changed a lot. So we're, we're we're able to distribute our dose differently. Sandy's going to talk about that in more detail in a few moments. Uh, but again, that's what it's done. We have also electronic portal imaging. Now what I mean, our recording. No, or basically we can now know exactly what we treated. Every day, any beam that comes out of our machine is recorded, is recorded. We know exactly what we did to you. We know exactly. We're gonna line you up with great precision. If we're off of just a few millimeters, we're gonna change it. We're gonna change that. So uh, we have that availability, and again, Sandy's gonna talk about that. We can, as I said, we can track everything we do. We have a tremendous amount of fail-safe systems to make sure you don't get overdosed. We know exactly what you're gonna get. There's the concept of overdosing uh, from a machine problem is, is really not, you don't see that. I mean, it's, we have so many different systems to back up. So we're, again, this is all about precision. First of all, let me just talk about CAT scanning. Again, I, we talked about the, the business of you putting up your, your chest against a cassette. Now what we do is we go through this, this uh, um, device, and you'll see just a really quick one of that, where the, the beam, we now can make the beam very small, the x-ray beam, and we have detectors on the other side, and that's moving around and creating an image, and basically your CAT scan, if you look at a CAT scan image, that is really not an x-ray. It's produced by an x-ray, but it's a summation of what we call coefficient of, of absorption 
and it's all in different planes that uh, we're not going to go through that other than the fact that we now come up with an image that is really a, a summation or a mathematical uh, grid is what we're talking about uh, what, what kind of ways that we look at it is it is that if you had a loaf of bread and we had a cancer inside that loaf of bread before cat skinning we all we could do is just shoot at that we could shoot at it, we would treat it from the front and the back and to the sides or something in that order. We said, wouldn't it be nice if we could actually open that thing up and put it in slices? And that's what the CAT scan did for us. What it does is it produces slices so that we can slice the body up. We can slice it up. Now we're talking about precision. Now we're talking about precision. <coughs> uh, obviously a CAT scan is, you've all, many of you have been in a CAT scan before. And, and you understand that, that you, you're motivated through, propelled through that opening there. Um, we exploit the fact that many of the cancers have um, more vascularity, so you'll get a, a IV contrast. Um, so we can actually see the cancer in, in more decision. Uh, this is just, a, again, this, I think you can read what it has to say. <laughs> The uh, technologist can change all the parameters of the images that she produces. Uh, and uh, we can decide how thick we want to make those slices. Uh, we can do different, different things to it to accent what we want to do and that's see that cancer. And, and also, it's not just the cancer, we want to see the surrounding tissue. Areas that we have to be able to, to protect. As you see here, this is again, my idea of what a, a tumor would look like inside of that slice, so that now we have the ability to uh, to do that. You've seen, I don't know if many of you have seen actual CAT scan images, but uh, if you could see here, you see the liver, here you see the, the spinal body, the vertebral body, and then the cord is right in there. Uh, so we know what we're gonna try to avoid. Not, we're not, and we're gonna try to avoid this. We know that's a limiting factor. We know that the liver is a limiting factor. The liver can only accept so much radiation. So we understand the tolerances. That's going to be the issue. This is, again, we see things from a different perspective. It really helps us understand. We can see that cancer much better. Uh, and the MRI has provided that for us. And I'm not going to go through that other than the fact that I'm going to say that uh, the body is put into a very a high uh, magnetic field, it might be a half Tesla, I mean, uh, yeah, a half Tesla, it might be a, up to two or three Tesla. That's a lot of um, magnetic field. And what basically what is happening is that the um, atoms, the individual atoms, their axes are being changed according to the magnetic field. We shoot um, a micro, uh, that's a, a a radio wave into that that changes the axis as it as its reflexes back it produces another wave and that's what's being uh, detected in the computer without the computer there's no way we would have any kind of, of image and it gives us a totally different perspective what we're now seeing we're now seeing the soft tissue cat scan works very well for uh, bone this is going to help us tremendously looking at soft tissue here you see Right here, you can actually see the globe. There's the, there's the uh, lens. This is the uh, optic nerve. Here's one of the muscles that's fat around uh, in, in the orbit. Here you see the brain stem and, and obviously the brain. So again, we have this detail that is amazing. It's amazing now that we have the ability to look at all that stuff. We're gonna give, if we can also give a contrast, which is gonna bring out different aspects about uh, normal tissue or the cancer. Uh, so we have lots of options open to us. This is a uh, PET scan. I don't know if you know what a PET scan is, but we are going to exploit the fact that cancers have most, more vascularity and actually they have more metabolic activity. So what we do is we give them a radioactive material that goes to where metabolism is happening. And so it's all about the comparison of that area of metabolism versus the other areas surrounding. So now all of a sudden we have uh, another aspect that we didn't have before. We're again defining more clearly the area, even if you have a mass that you see in, let's say it's in the lung, maybe it's not metabol uh, metabolically active, maybe it's benign. So the CAT scan, I mean the PET scan helps us determine whether this is moving or not. 
Now, it's got some false positive and false negative. We're not going to go into this. Not, that's not what this talk's about. <laughs> but here's the deal. Here's the deal. The nice thing about this, now we can register that with our CAT scan. And now we're going to not only register, we're going to combine it. And what we're going to have now is that we have different uh, landmarks for us to treat this patient with far more precision, far more precision. The precision now is getting very, very tight on this, and this is important as we look at our treatment. We use a, a different forms of radiation. We're going to show you today the linear accelerator. Also, I'm going to go a little bit through my prostate implants. Dr. Koch will talk to you about ultra precision with radio surgery. Um, basically, all we're doing is accelerating the electrons. It goes down to something called a waveguide. We can bend that electron field, uh, a beam through uh, magnetic forces again. And then what we do is that comes down, oh, as we come down this waveguide, uh, it goes bent. Now here is where all the action takes place. Because now we're going to shape that treatment field. And in this, right in here in this head, is where I was talking about this multi-leaf call reader. And again, Sandy will show that to you. We can produce uh, uh, photons. Photon is a wave. It's a typical thing you think of an x-ray. It could also be uh, electrons. And we do have protons. I was at Fermilab for a number of years and we accelerated uh, and produced uh, neutrons. So uh, that's a whole different issue. That was, again, we, uh, that was a heavy particle. Um, anyway, that's a whole different issue. I'm not going to go there. Uh, basically, what we do is we treat five days a week. We know that um, we, we know that the we're going to injure normal cells. It just we exploit the difference for the fact that cancer cells can't repair themselves as thoroughly and quickly as normal cells. So you get little, 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 and it's a, a, a summation of all those that treatment and the absorption uh, that we exploit. Um, the actual treatment time is very actually very little. It's basically setting up, and again, uh, Sandy will talk about that. The key here is dose, 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 dose. We've got to get a dose, dose in. And um, the higher the dose, the, uh, the better we are. And, and I don't know if I, could, if I went by the slide. Yeah, I did go by the slide. But as we look at the issues, we have to know what are we doing? What's, what's our purpose of giving the radiation? Are we giving it? as the only treatment, so that dose might be different. Every and Different tumors need different doses. So we have to know what the tumor is. We have to know what's our purpose. Are we going to give it post-operatively? Because many times over the years, I would see people and they'd come in and say, you know, I don't know why we got it. My doctor said I got it all. Now let me give you a little perspective. If you look at a tumor, a cubic centimeter, roughly a half inch, that is one billion tumor cells. Now, what the doctor is saying is that I got everything I can see. Now, we know that these are very small cells, very, very small, very small. So our role may be what we call post-operatively to get rid of any microscopic disease left over. That needs a certain dose in a different way we do it. It may be the fact that we're going to do the whole thing ourselves, or it may be that we're going to combine it with chemotherapy, which is going to give us synergistic effect. So we have to be always looking at what are we trying to achieve, what is the dose we're, we're trying to get, what are the side effects. <clears throat> and that's really our art. The art of radiation is to, to, to know <coughs> what that balance is. And that's not easy. OK, uh, next is going to be Sandy Brindley. Uh, she is a, uh, she's the lead uh, dosimetrist. I, I'm going to tell you this. We are a team. I mean, literally a team. We cannot do our treatment our job without everybody on board and everybody functioning correctly. I don't know if it's like any other uh, department, but we are totally interdependent. And, and Sandy is just wonderful to work with. Uh, I come to Sandy and I say, this is a woman in chief. She does it. And so she's the brains um, in many ways. And so um, obviously we as physicians, I have to decide the parameters and we go over everything with them in detail as well. Okay, Sandy. Good morning. Thank Good you morning. for letting me speak today. Um, I'm just going to
take a deep breath because it's such a big group of people. <laughs> um, once again, my name is Sandy. I um, have been a docentist at um, St. Joe's Hospital for about 30 years. And um, what I'm going to show you today is basically what my job is to do is prepare the plans for treatment. Um, but it's come so far um, with the new technology nowadays, how we can do it and achieve it. Um, it's come full circle. Um, so computers are involved in, in the beginning of the patient's journey in radiation therapy, from registra registration, planning, and execution of the treatments. The evolution of computers has changed how we see things. Now we see, see things in more of a 3D fashion. And um, our challenge, one of our biggest challenges is, um, for the radiation therapy is to deliver enough dose to the cancer um, cells, but also to spare the, um, the tissues around that. And once again, the team approach comes in play because we have to work with each other to be sure that we are um, checking and doing double checks um, and working with everybody to be sure that execution um, is delivered for the patient to receive the excellent <coughs> care that they all deserve. Um, so once again, with the team approach, I work with the radiation oncologist, the physicist, the dosimetrist, and the therapist. When I create a plan, um, I cannot just go and allow them to be treated. I have to show the plan to the doctors. They have to give their blessing and say that they approve of it. It has to be approved by the physicist. And um, then I prepare it for the treatment and then the therapist have to execute it. Um, one of my goals when the um, patient first starts is I have to align and um, outline all the anatomy of the patient and the doctor comes in and draws the tumor volume and reviews what I have drawn, if there are any questions um, of the areas that need to be treated. And so for the patient, the, the initial treatment starts with the patient receiving a CT scan, which Dr. Schaefer um, explained a little bit. And basically what we wanna do is get the patient in the position that they will be treated on a daily basis. So we need to have them as comfortable as possible because the treatment, they have to lay there for a certain length of time. Um, but we also want to know that they're not going to be uncomfortable so that there will be movement because the precision in, um, for aiming the beam is very, very important. So this is just a, um, to show a setup of a head and neck patient, which we make a um, aquaplast, which this is just a mask around to hold the area in place. And every day the patient would receive that mask, um, would be put on the patient for their treatment. <clears throat> Now, this, these films, as Dr. Shaver showed before, years ago, we used to just take um, like an x-ray film, two films, and our doctors would physically draw the area that they want to have treated. So these, this is some anatomy, but this may be the tumor area that needs to be treated. And this red in here are blocks that they have drawn that they would not like radiation not to get there. So what we would have to do is go in and cut these blocks out and pour an actual, what we call cerebrum block, and put it up into the head of the machine where the radiation would hit it first so that the radiation would be absorbed and it would not treat that area. Nowadays, because of the advancement of computers, the machines do all that and we no longer have to lift blocks at anywhere away from, they would be about a pound to anywhere from 30 pounds that we would have to lift up above and put on a tray. So once the patient has had a CT scan, it comes to our treatment planning system. And this is where um, we need to draw the anatomy, as I had said before, and we can visualize things in 3D. And as Dr. Schaefer had said before, this is just a CT slice, like a slice of bread. So we take um, the CT scan through the area that we are interested in treating. Um, there are a couple different types of treatments that we deliver. There's what we call 3D um, conformal treatment planning and IMRT, and I will explain that a little bit more um, in just a second. But um, these are just the structures that we outline on the patient. This little yellow kind of box that's angling out is a field that we physically can put on in the computer, and we can ask the computer to generate what we call isodose lines to show what type of um, doses are getting to that tumor area that the doctor would like to treat. Um, so let me just go back a second. So 3D treatment planning or 3D conformal treatment planning is where we can 
place beans on the patient, and it's usually anywhere from one to four beans, and they're stationary. We um, would angle the beam and turn the beam on and go back in the room and angle the beam to another angle and treat the patient again. Um, and when we block out areas, we'll block out areas such as right in here where the yellow is, that's where we do not want radiation to get. And um, blocks are created in the top of the, in the, top of the um, treatment machine so that the radiation will not treat that area. Another type of treatment, what we do is called intensity modulated radiation therapy is where the, pa the treatments are going around the patient. So we're angling at, var at various angles, usually anywhere from five to nine beams or sometimes the actual machine will continuously rotate around the patient and be delivering the treatment. And the blocking pattern for that is not that it, the block is just in place, but the blocks, the leaves will actually move around the patient as the patient is being treated. So um, that's, it's called intensity modulated radiation therapy. These are just some views of conventional um, radiation therapy and also IMRT. This is where there's like three beams coming into a tumor volume. These beams do not move around the patient. There, there's areas that are blocked out, whereas this IMRT patient, there are many beams and it'll rotate around the patient. And this 3D view is representing how the patient is being treated with these various angles. And this little green area is the tumor area that we are trying to treat. Once the patient has had their plan and it has been checked by the doctor, uh, we can prepare it for their treatment. So this is the linear accelerator suite that we have at St. Joe's. And not only do we take precautions in our planning part of it, but also in the treatment room itself, they are very, because of the energies that we use, the um, doors are very thick lined. They are lead lined, um, precision and accuracy, not only for the planning, but also in the treatment room is taken into account because you want safety with all the radiation that is being used. And um, once again, Dr. Schaefer said that the treatments are basically five days a week and they're very, very short, um, short time frame. And I have a short video here that'll just show you how precise some of the, how can I click that on? We had a video to show you what the how the precision of the computers work nowadays. What we do is um, the little yellow, the little green X's here. Normally we have marks on the patients. We call it a 3D setup. We initially set up the patient, and what we can do is take a, a, a small CAT scan or some films in the actual treatment room, and we can overlay those films that we took. From, with the plan that we created from the original CT of the patient and precisely move the anatomy to match up so that we know every day that we are within millimeters of that treatment area. So there isn't much movement and if there is a change, we have to go back to the drawing board. Sometimes the patient will have to be reCTed. Sometimes um, we may have to take more films. Um, it could be due to weight loss. So every day we're checking those and being sure that our precision is right on. And this is just a film of showing um, how we can take, and there's a little bit darker boxes in these, four, these corners, and it's showing that um, these little lines um, are contours of anatomy that I have drawn. <clears throat> and this um, image right down here is the image that was probably taken that day. So what we do is overlay those so that they're matching so that the skull area, this is the spine, they're all matching up before we would actually go and deliver the treatment to the patient. This is what computers have done for us to, to get a, to be able for us to be able, so accurate. Now once again, this is, I was talking about the, um, Dr. Schaefer was talking about the linear accelerator and the blocking. And we did have a video here too, but unfortunately it's not going to work. But this is the leaf patterns of what is created in the top of the machine to show that um, this area is where you would like it to be treated. And all these, these are called, this is called a 
multi-lead collimator, and these are all tungsten lead um, little um, beamlets that we want the radiation not to be not to get through. So it absorbs as the beam is getting through here and being treated. This part is being the radiation is being absorbed, and um, when we do IMRT treatments, these leaves will physically move as the beam is rotating around the patient. So depending on what areas we're treating and how much radiation we want to get to a specific area, those leaves will move at different speeds. And this, once again, is just a, an example of a patient, a head and neck patient that is being treated. And um, this green, this kind of, I guess, fuchsia colored, um, is the tumor volume that the doctor had drawn and the yellow around it is a margin that we give to be sure that we're encompassing the whole entire volume that we want to treat. And this is showing that um, this is one day of treatment and then after five day of treatment you can see that the same um, structure was put on but you can see how much the um, area has gone down. And this is just another representation of a tumor volume that was drawn and within a certain frame of time, how it had responded to the radiation. So once again, not only um, is my job to do the planning, but we also have to be very accurate in what we do by our quality assurance. So we um, have checks and double checks. Like I said, before I do a, a treatment plan, I have to have it approved by the physician. The physicist has to approve it. It has to be checked. Um, before it can be sent over to the patients. We have to take initial films for the patients before they begin their treatment. Um, there's daily checks and weekly checks and annual checks on the machine. Be sure the dose output is correct every day. And um, so there's different eyes looking at different things and um, it just ensures accuracy is um, very, very precise. And not only is um, do I do treatment planning, but we also have to take into account the safety of um, the general public and the employees. And um, so we have to monitor the radiation by, we have um, monthly film badges that we have to be sure that we are within the standards. Um, we survey to be sure there isn't any radiation um, available. Um, we also have signs that we post to be sure that everybody's aware um, what is happening and um, any type of other type of um, treatments that we give, there's sh shielding that's very important. You go into a treatment room, if a patient's receiving a different type of implant, a um, radioactive isotope or something, we have to use shielding so that the radiation uh, is absorbed. So once again, we have to um, have rules and safety for everybody involved. Thank you. What you've been seeing is what we call teletherapy, it means treat from a distance. We're going to talk about brachytherapy, which means treat from a short distance. So it's a, teletherapy is a long distance, short distance is brachytherapy, and that's what we're going to talk about now. Um, let's see. Uh, and I think that's just what I was showing you right there. Okay. Uh, let's just quickly look at the male anatomy. And I, I'm going to break it to you guys that if you live long enough, you'll get prostate cancer. If you look at um, autopsies at 90 year olds, 95% at the time of autopsy will have some element of prostate cancer, but only one in six will know because only one in six become clinically uh, important. I hate to break it to you ladies too, that as a, if we were to take all your breasts off at the time you're 50 years of age, you would have 50% would have some element of breast cancer, but only one and eight will ever know in their lifetime. So cancer is around us. We just, but it's again, if it clinically, it, it, we have to deal with it if it becomes important. So we're going to talk about prostate cancer. But this is my area. Uh, if, again, the prostate is right here. It's a, at the base of the bladder. You see the bladder here. This is called the summit of vesicle that stores sperm. Um, and obviously, you know the rest. You can see the rest of the anatomy. Um, <laughs> what what we're looking at is when. We do teletherapy too, depending on if we want to treat the surrounding lymph nodes or not. We know that the cancer is going to spread by three basic ways, and those guys that have been my patients here know that we go through the, they go through my class right at the time, and we spend a lot of time using pictures and diagrams, really looking at the issues related to prostate cancer. 
So we know that some of the cancer is going to be spread uh, to the surrounding structures, with like the seminal vesicle or even to the lymph nodes. But as we look at, so those patients that are going to, that we're worried about having spread beyond the prostate, we, we have to do a regional treatment as well as a local treatment. Uh, this is just to show you that the, the, the prostate itself will move. So when we, when we talk about IGRT, so it's image guided radiation and we're using IMRT, uh, intensity modulated radiation, there's a lot of fancy words there. But uh, what we're gonna do is we wanna take in consideration that prostate is moving every day, every day. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have to fix it. And we fix it with this balloon. Now this goes in every day. Now you're gonna look at it and say, oh my goodness, it isn't really that bad. I would, I'm not gonna call anybody out in this group that has already experienced it, but it really isn't that bad. But it, it is fantastic because what it's gonna do, it's gonna do two things for me. Number one, it's gonna spread the anterior wall away from the posterior wall. So I'm gonna cause less damage within the, the rectum from the radiation standpoint. But more importantly, it's gonna fix it. You can actually move between um, up to, up to a, a, a half an inch with respirations. And we don't think about the fact that these, we're, we're hitting moving targets. So what we can do is we have to take that in consideration. That's a whole new area, it's called 60, and it's, it's something that we're now looking at and we will have the ability to make those changes as your heart, I mean, as your lung, as you breathe, the cancer in your lung and it's gonna move too. So we have the, we're getting the ability to actually roll with the punches and, and change your beat as that, as, as you, as that, that tumor is moving. So th those are very much in the near future. Uh, we will have all the equipment to do that fairly shortly. So this is just a little device that we use. Uh, and again, if this is just to show what teletherapy might look like, uh, again, these are those leaves that we're talking about. We can adjust it, this being the prostate. Um, and then this, this could be in the lymph nodes in this area right in here. Okay, and IMRT again is what Sandy mentioned. We're coming in at all different distances and we intersect right at this point and this is where your high beam is gonna be, your high dose beam. Okay, and again, just to show you some of the isodose curves and we know exactly what area is gonna get what dose. Um, I'll let you read that yourself. I thought this was... <laughs> Brachytherapy. Uh, again, uh, we're using a, a, a radioactive pellet. We're using IPA25, and that's inside a plate, uh, inside a tandem carrier. And you can actually see these guys right here, the size of the pencil lead. Here's where an x ray would be after we've done our implant. Now, we're going to actually put the tumor, the, the seeds, right into the prostate. And, and, and so you're, here's the key. The key is the fact that the 90% of your dose is absorbed within 10 millimeters. That's about a half inch of that, that source. So you put a lot of sources in and you keep your dose really concentrated. You, you, and you can raise your, your, your level of your uh, dose up considerably because you're not worried about the surrounding tissue. Here's what we're gonna do, first of all. Uh, this is not a torture chamber. All right, this is uh, not water, waterboarding, although you think we are, but we're not. Um, this is the transducer, ultrasound transducer. These are stirrups, ladies. We put men in stirrups too, so equal, equal uh, turnaround, right? Uh, so this is, these are stirrups, and we're gonna put this into the rectum. This is all, uh, this is called a, uh, this is our stand. It's controlled by the computer, and, um, uh, Sandy and Jim are the people that do this, and they're very, very good that we've done. Our, our, our program at one time, I don't know the statistics today, we're number two in terms of those done in the whole state of Illinois. So we're very active, very active. Um, but anyway, we're gonna generate, the computer is gonna generate for us a three-dimensional figure. And that, that's gonna be key. Because what is gonna go, Sandy's gonna go back, or Jim's gonna go back, and they're going to try different seed arrangements. We spent a lot of time doing this saying, okay, what is the best way to place those seeds into the prostate? I'm gonna tell you right now, there are no, no carbon copies. You'd say, well, there's only, that's a prostate. 
Oh, I mean, there are many, 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 many different shapes of prostates. Nothing is the same. Nothing is the same. So every person change presents us with a challenge. If you had a rotor root job, for example, where they do remount, now we've got to deal with that. And that's not easy because we only can put our needles in straight lines. So it, it creates a challenge. Now what we can do is, as I was just saying, we can do treatment planning so we know uh, we can change our activity, which means how hot that seed is or how much radiation is in that seed. So we can change it again based on the configuration of the gland. Um, yeah, let's go on a little bit. Okay, this is what we're gonna do. Once we have our plan, and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna put these needles in and we have a template right here to help guide us. The only way we can see that per, that's, that prostate is by an ultrasound image. It's kind of like sonar. So it's like, it would, it's basically what it is. It just show, it is, is sonar and we can follow that uh, by doing, now we're actually putting the needles in. It, it, it's a little bit more dicey than you think because that, that prostate can be real hard. So anytime your needle hits it, just will deviate your, your uh, needle. We're having to spear that from quite a distance. And you want to get precise. Now, I started this in 81. Um, we did a little differently. We actually opened up the abdomen and went down from the top. Uh, about, and, and that all changed. Thank, thank, thank God it changed because we were, that's a tough, tough deal. Now what we do is we go underneath the scrotum. And you will never, most of you will never see the place we go in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll say the patient. <laughs> Unless you want to show off, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, you can see what we're doing right here. And now we can actually watch that needle go in. This actually happens to be the cinematoscope. There's the bladder, prostate sits right here. Just take my word for it. Um, and and, and that we're going to drop those seeds in based on what we're seeing right there. And you can see here, um, this happens to be the urethra right here, the, the, and, and here are the seeds that you can see right in this area. So we try to stay out of the center. We've got to be careful that we don't get the urethra too whole hot, which means radiation-wise. And you can see just again more of the same. And then, and then we can do, what we'll do is we'll do a CAT scan afterwards. About a, roughly a month later, we'll do a CAT scan, and uh, now we'll know exactly where this, the seeds are. Because remember, the seed is smaller than the hole we're going to put the seed into. So you can actually move that. So we tell our patients, you cannot do any heavy lifting. You can't do any, um, uh, we, we want you to take a low profile for the next uh, the two weeks, and that uh, helps marry those seeds in. And I, I say, I don't care if you want to be Mr universe I don't care because now your your seeds are all married in nice and what we're going to do is we're going to actually did a CAT scan and then we can go back and actually know exactly where we, what we did um, and I, I'm going to put this in because this is the person our patient is controlled by who sees that patient the urologist sees them uh, and I have my running debate with my urologist and I've been doing this for a long time. Um, we do very, very well. Very, very well. We preserve, it's very unlikely that you will be, um, that you'll be impotent, although it can happen, and there's issues we can deal with that. Uh, there's ways of taking care of that. Obviously, as we get older, we're losing the fire in our furnace, because that's just part of, part of getting older we lose roughly a 1.3 percent of our testosterone every year so when we get up to my age you know you're pretty deficient in that area and and so that affects those those issues uh so we try to deal with that um but the point is we want to make it so that we help preserve that function for you just so you don't feel that you're not a, able to be a man in that situation and that's only if that's an issue to you. If it's not an issue with you, it's not an issue to us. So um, I just want to show you this was these are some of the best. Uh, this is one of the best comparisons. We, we are, these were comparisons of robotic, which is the Da Vinci, um, uh, external beam, um, uh, protons, uh, cryo, which means freezing, um, hyperthermia, which um, is another form. 
Um, and th this is where we are. This is a, using seeds now. These are for localized patients. And, and you can't see it, it's too busy of a slide. But this is at, and you gotta look at 10 years. You gotta look at your 10 year survival rates. And, and here's where the seeds are up in here. And this is between, this is roughly into the 90%. So we do very, very well with this. With, and you're not down a long time. You don't, you don't have in, in, incontinence unless they go and try to do a rotor rooter after we do this, which makes it a more difficult issue. Okay, uh, what I, I, I'm going to introduce my uh, colleague, um, Dr. Koch. Is um, uh, he's just a delight to work with. Um, I've worked with many different radiation oncologists. He's, he's, he's just superb. He is a radiation neuro oncologist. Or, uh, fellowship trained. We don't see many of those guys. He's very unique in that area. So he's going to talk to you about radio surgery, which I again is uh, ultra pre precision radiation. Uh, he's one of the very few that around this area that does that. Thanks. So good morning. Um, as Dr. Schaefer mentioned, uh, one of my areas of specialty is um, neuro-oncology, um, which is the treatment of brain tumors. Um, and I just wanted to talk with you a little bit of how um, computers has really changed um, the practice of medicine, my practice specifically. Um, and I think an example that I can give is um, this past Tuesday evening, um, it's about four days ago, I got a call from a colleague of mine about a, um, a patient with um, testicular cancer who had the cancer spread to his brain. And um, the patient is 35 years old, um, and he wanted us to um, see the patient and consider giving the patient stereotactic radio surgery, which is giving patient uh, localized radiation to the tumors in the brain because he was to be seen in about a week um, to prepare him for um, a bone marrow transplant. So um, he, um, he texted me uh, that time of night um, and I called him back. Um, he then texted me an image of the tumor. Um, so we talked about that you know, with, the, with the image in hand to be able to look at. And then I saw the patient the next day. The patient had their um, their MRIs, which you, we talked about, um, that were done, that we reviewed, that was emailed, um, some of them to our department. I'm just trying to go through how computers really kind of speed things along. Um, you know, image, uh, information was faxed to us, um, brought to us by disk that we're able to download. And then what happened after that is that we, I saw the patient, the patient had his MRI the following day, um, saw the neurosurgeon that following day. And then on Thursday, we were able to um, bring the patient into the department and um, administer the stereotactic radio surgery, um, which was done successfully. I think um, five years ago, even, I don't think could, things could have moved that quickly without the, the aid of, of computers and technology. And certainly when radio surgery started back in 1959 in Sweden with Dr. Lars Lexell, what they were doing then is that they were actually mapping everything out on paper and the coordinates on paper to know how to move the patient in the X, Y, and Z plane to localize the tumors. Now we have, as Dr. Schaefer and Sandy mentioned, the benefit of the technologies with CT scans and MRI to do that. So let me just go through with you briefly what this procedure involves. So typically, the patient would have an MRI before they are treated. Um, as Dr. Schaefer mentioned, the MRI is a scan that has very high resolution for, for certain parts of the body, and one of them is the brain. We can see the um, contents of the brain, including the nerves and the different parts of the brain, with very, very precise detail. So the patient would have an MRI, the morning of the procedure, the patient would then come to our department and under local anesthesia, a stereotactic frame is placed. And some people use the name a halo. So what that 
What the frame is, it's, um, it's a device, usually either round or square, that's placed over the patient's head, and then um, it is then screwed through the skin um, into the bone. So it's not going into the brain, it's going, attaching itself to the bone. Um, with the frame in place, the patient then has a CAT scan. Um, the reason why we do the CAT scan is that because it has very good resolution for bone. So, um, whereas the MRI has better resolution for the contents of the brain. So with the frame in place, the patient has a CAT scan. We then fuse, as Dr. Schaefer mentioned, the CAT scan image with the MRI image because the cats, we can see the bone very well on the CAT scan and the soft tissues very, very well on MRI. We can then localize the area and then we go through slice by slice, um, as in a loaf of bread, slice by slice and outline each structure in the brain. So the lens, optic nerves, optic chiasm, brain stem tuner, everything, bone, skin, and then we make a three-dimensional rendering of the patient's intracranial contents. With that image, um, we're able to then decide how we need to angle the beam. Um, any blocks we need to put in the path of the beam to shield any critical structures. And the, um, not in this case, but in other cases, the energy or strength of the beam. Because our mandate is to treat the areas that we want to treat um, and see those areas very carefully and avoid any normal structures. Radio surgery, as Dr. Schaefer mentioned, takes it to a different level because within like a millimeter or two past the tumor, which you can see here, there should be no dose. So then we can treat, for example, lesions very close to your optic nerve, optic chiasm, and those areas will get no dose. So let's go through some of these slides and I can show what I'm talking about. So this is not the patient, but this is a similar patient. So this is the tumor in the brain. This is a um, sagittal slice, so it's taken like this. And you open the patient's head, head out um, of the brain. You can see parts of the eye here. This is one of the sinuses. So anything that is um, air-filled will not stop the beam of the skin and it will show up as being dark. Things that are very dense will attenuate or stop the beam, like bone, and show up as being very white. Things that are in between bone and ear will show up as being gray or intermediate. So brain is gray, tuber picks up a lot of the contrast material that we give it, so it shows up as being white. Um, this is just a image, different images showing what we're talking about, how we're able to contour everything. So it's like the person is really inside of the computer now, and we can rotate things around and see where things are um, in the brain. You can see here this slice, you can see the eyes, sinuses, um, person's skin, um, and different areas in the brain. And this shows, for example, with this particular patient, what we can do. So this is after all the slices have been contoured and outlined in the computer. You can see, this is a computer rendering of the individual. So you can see here, the eyes here. So it's as if the patient is laying on his back and his feet are, are kind of coming out that way. And these are showing the angles of all the beams that we're going to use to focus on this tumor. You can see the brain stem here and the spinal cord. Another view of that same patient. Again, different beams coming in. Eyes, optic nerves, brain stem. I'm sorry, spinal cord, brainstem, you can see the ears here. Another view. This is the machine that we use to treat the patient, as Dr. Schaefer said. It's a varian um, linear accelerator. So as Dr. Schaefer mentioned, it accelerates or speeds up the um, radiation in a straight or linear fashion. fashion. Um, and we use it for radiosurgery. Um, as I mentioned, radiosurgery means we're localizing the tumor very accurately in a, the X, Y, and Z plane. And because it's felt to be so precise, it replaces surgery. The patient lays on the table here, and this part of the machine is called the gantry, rotates around the patient, distributing the radiation. Um, this is a special device we put on the machine to allow us to deliver the radiation precisely. And Sandy was talking to you about the collimators, which are the 
the leaves inside the, the, the machine that helps to block part of the beam and also shape the beam to um, conform to the size and the shape of the tumor. So this is a different type of collimator that we put on that has even more leaves in it that are tiny. The leaf size in this measure from three millimeters to five millimeters, and there are 120 of them. So it can really conform to the size of the, of the tumors. That's placed. This is the frame being placed, as I mentioned, under local anesthesia. These are the screws that are placed in. Um, we put this localizing box in place um, before the patients had a CAT scan. The patient has a CAT scan, then they're laid on the table with the frame here attached to the table. This is a localizing box in place showing where we want to aim the beam. And this is that device I put on, you can see up here. So the beam is coming right through here where you see the pointer is. The frame is taken off at the end of the day. So this takes, the, the frame is put on in the morning, like say 8, 738. And depending on the number of lesions, the frame is taken off either mid-afternoon or later in the evening after the patient is treated. So it's an outpatient procedure. This is at the end of the patient, the day when the patient's being, has finished her treatments. Um, and um, that really summarizes the radio surgery. And as I said, how computer, computers can have revolutionized, because I can go from being in my home and communicating with physicians by text and seeing pictures on my iPhone and you know, bring the patient in the next day, get all the information amassed very quickly, treat the patient, and then send them off to get his bone marrow transplant in a matter of a couple of days. Thank you. In honor of breast, um, breast Cancer Month and the ladies of the house, and men actually, who can also get breast cancer, I also just wanted to mention to you a little bit about um, a procedure called partial breast radiation. This also involves a lot of computer work, but what the move now with radiation oncology, not only in the brain, but elsewhere in the body, is to really minimize any normal tissue that's treated. And we know now that for early stage breast cancer, that we can um, treat just the area of where the tumor is located. And in order to do that, we have to get, give very focused radiation, similar to what you can do in the brain, but in the breast area. So now, um, with um, devices that we have at present St. Joseph Hospital, we can treat just the area where the tumor is, and instead of the patient receiving five, six, sometimes seven weeks of radiation treatments coming in every single day, the treatments can be given in one week. The treatments are typically given twice a week for five, five days. It does involve placing a catheter inside the breast area, which stays in place for the entire week. But um, it's something that is, I'd say, relatively pain-free. That's what I'm told by all the patients after it's, played, it's in place. And then the patient comes in twice a day. We hook them up to a special machine, and local radiation is given to the area where the tumor is in the breast. We now have very solid 12-year data with patients receiving this partial breast radiation. The local control is identical to um, the uh, more general radiation. Local control is identical to having a mastectomy as is survival. So instead of six weeks, one week. And I'd like to introduce Lori Schaffner, our um, director. being in, in charge of the cancer center and medical imaging at St. Joe's, um, we have, you're probably wondering, there are many cancer centers in the Chicago area. I liken it to like the Walgreens we see all around us, right? They're on every corner. But um, we have a very special team that has some longevity in our cancer center at St. Joe's. Um, there are many more people than who have spoken today. Um, a lot of them have been there for, for many years. They have, they've come from highly academic universities and we really work hard together and uh, every day you wake up some people might think it might be sad to work in a cancer center i will tell you from my own experience it's quite the opposite we get so much uh, joy and love by being um, 
affected in, in communicating and helping our patients. It's not work. It's it's a it's passion. It doesn't feel like work because we love what we do. And I think we're fortunate to have such a close team. Um, and we're, we always say we're like family because we spend a lot of time together uh, during the week and sometimes on the weekends a little bit. But um, it, it's very um, rewarding. Um, this is some data that I unloaded last night from the website just to share how, what do you think the patient experience is. I'm being very transparent. Uh, this is all from 2004 thus far as of last night from the website. And you can see, look at how many patients say that their, the quality of care was excellent. I think this is outstanding. Um, there were 14, and this is uh, end size of, I believe it says 142 patients. So that's pretty amazing. These, by the way, um, these are patients that have gone through all different kinds of cancer care in our center. Um, we didn't have any pores, which I think is great. Um, and then this is from last year, the whole year. And this end size was, quite larger because it was a whole calendar year. Again, I just wanted to be transparent and share with you on what our patients experienced and uh, anonymous random survey was sent to them. Um, I would like to know if you guys have any questions or comments for our, our panel. If you guys could come up, Dr. Cole, Dr. Schaefer and Sandy. Oh, oh okay. So we have a gentleman up in the back um, raising his hand with the blue, um, blue sweater. Are oh, they going to the mic? Yeah. Somebody. Yeah. This question is uh, probably for Dr. Goat. Uh, seven years ago, next month, I was my first neurosurgeon told me I had to do something about a tumor that she had observed for three years. And one of the things she said, uh, I just took your case to the tumor board of our hospital. You are qualified for a new machine that we just got in called CyberKnife. Would you comment on what that is? And <clears throat> I actually didn't do that. She referred me to another neurosurgeon who's head of one of the units downtown Chicago. He decided to take it out rather than treat it. But could you tell me a little bit, or tell us a little bit about what CyberKnife radiation is? Um, so CyberKnife radiation is, a, is one of the ways of administering radio surgery. As I mentioned, radio surgery is just giving precise radiation to one area in the brain. Um, and um, it can be administered through the LINAC, as I showed you. It can be administered through a gamma knife. It can be administered through a cyber knife. It can be administered through proton therapy. So the cyber knife is just another machine that gives this precise radiation that we call radio surgery. Um, with respect to the tumor that you had, um, it really depends on the type of tumor to really um, speak of the appropriateness of doing surgery versus radio surgery. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Steve, and at the end of your presentation, you showed that radiation machine. I was just curious, who's the manufacturer on that? The manufacturer of that particular machine is Varian, um, but the, the linear accelerators are made by many different companies. The two most um, commonly seen ones are Varian, um, and there's also Electa and Siemens. See, this particular one was Varian. I would say most people are, are um, leaning towards Varian. Thank you. <clears throat> this is to the uh, entire group. As I look at <clears throat> this whole subject of cancer, I put it into three major categories. Preventing it, what you do once you know you have cancer, and the third is the diagnostic or data accumulation. And this has been magnificent. You've all done a wonderful job, both the data collection people, the researchers, you that are on first line. And that diagnostic accumulation of data can be used for both the prevention and treating it afterwards, as you have shown here today. My question is this, do you know how far away we are from either diminishing that time between knowing that you have cancer and where you could give it a proper 
and wiping out any discrepancy in that area or in the area of the prevention of cancer I give you a little uh, one caveat on that without major changes in one's lifestyle that means <laughs> at 80 years old please don't take my scotch and my wine away from me <laughs> Amen. Incidentally, all of you have done one marvelous job today. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Schaefer. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask Dr. Schaefer to comment on that. Um, in the in the near future, um, cancer care is going to change and is changing very rapidly. Well, first of all, when we talk about cancer, it's like saying automobile. Well, what are you talking about? I mean, it's just, it, it, cancer just is a generic term to us. We want to know what kind of cancer you're talking about. Um, and we know today that the problem is, is that these uh, cells are kind of going on their own. They're, they're not listening to the body anymore. And so we know that the, the problem is a switching problem we have the ability, our cells have the ability to reproduce themselves. Uh, if you go back to high school biology, you, you will remember that you learned that every seven years that you replace every cell in your body. Well, if it's in your mouth, you actually replace it twice a day. Your stool is full of, of, of cells that you have sloughed from your, your mouth. In the brain, now that's gonna take a lot longer time for those cells to reproduce themselves. So what we call is, it, is that we call the original cell, we call the mother cell, it's going to produce a, a, uh, a, another cell to replace, or the replacement cell. We call that the daughter cell. Well, how does the body know that the mother cell doesn't, isn't needed anymore? You ever think about that? Well, because we have switches. We have called suppressor genes, and they turn on and they say, okay, mother cell, we don't need you anymore. Well, what happens is in cancer, that switch gets turned off. And so now mother cell makes another cell. She makes another cell. She makes another cell. And now we've got a problem. We have a switching problem. We are going to know very shortly, uh, we are talking all this business about genetics. We, we hear all these terms about genetics. Well, and, and that's true. Uh, I had prostate cancer. I had a serious prostate cancer. My dad died of it. My granddad died of it. I just had to be in that progression, that genetic progression, and I got it. So we know that we're passing on this tendency to have, to have um, cancer. Um, what cancer, will, at least what the genes will do is they produce what's called protein. We're now, it's a new field, and you've ever, never heard of it before. It's called proteinomics. So if you look at the cell surface, there's all these different proteins. They're called signature proteins. And they also are part of the switching mechanism. They are also making uh, decisions of what that cell is going to do. So as we learn how to talk to cells, we're going to be able to talk to them and say, you know what? We don't want you around anymore. You're gone. You're history. And that's the beauty of what's going to happen. As far as to prevention, um, you know, lifestyle does make a difference. And I'm not saying, I'm not gonna take your scotch away from you. <laughs> uh, but we do make lifestyle changes. That, that I give a talk, it's called Lifestyle Changes in Cancer. And just very basically, I'm also, and many of you I know from working at the, uh, at the gym. I see Jim there, Jim's been there years and years and years. But what Jim is doing, he's putting money into his health bank we spend a lot of money coming out here to live here, but we can make changes, and one of it is strictly by exercising, watching your diet. What we know is by exercise now that we can energize what's called tumor killer cells. It's a type of white cell. So if in my field, for example, of prostate cancer, if you work out to a sweat and you do it three days a week, you reduce the cancer's virulence by 15 to 25%. And all you did is you just bought some tennis shoes 
That's all you did. And it didn't cost you a whole lot. So yes, you can make changes. And thank you, that's a very good question. I appreciate you bringing it up. So there is prevention. Some of it you cannot prevent because it's just in your genetic pool. And But there are life studies that, you know, if you're in tobacco, you know, that has, <coughs> that has a negative effect. Uh, so that, that's basically, did I answer your question? Yeah, okay. Dr. Schaefer, could you also comment on any kind of dietary modifications in prostate cancer, please? <laughs> Scotch is okay. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah it, it has again to do with uh, your fatty diet. I would recommend <laughs> that you stick to your steaks and your prime ribs no more than twice a week. And again, I think actually preferably once a week. And here's a good axiom, a very good axiom. And that is what's good for the prostate is good for the heart. What's good for the heart is good for the prostate. So you follow what your cardiologist says and you're helping your prostate. Mm. And with respect to the, back to the scotch, um, <laughs> we, what we know is that two drinks a day should be the maximum in terms of cancer reduction. Um, there's definitely um, very strong data out there showing that um, it reduces the risk of um, certainly breast cancer um, and also colorectal cancer in addition to head and neck cancer. Um, so I think the two drink a day is something that most people are advocating nowadays. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, at the beginning, you mentioned radiology five days a week and then two off. Is that because it's a weekend? Or? And I could I just ask one more. We see all these ads for cancer centers of America. Maybe you can't comment on that, but <laughs> it seems like you have sort of the same type of a team, and it would be closer. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I think our, our team is. is no, I, I think our team is not some, our team is better. That's what I would say. Um, I, um, I yeah, really cannot comment on the Cancer Centers of America. I think they have a different focus um, in terms of the stage of the cancer uh, of patients that they're treating, that they're seeing. Um, and um, as you mentioned, we're certainly closer. With respect to the, uh, the fractionation, as we call it, or the amount of treatments one gets per week, we have to do a very, it's a very delicate balance between um, the benefits and the side effects of radiation treatments. And historically, we found that by giving patients those two days off a week, you're sparing some of the normal tissue and some of the side effects that the patients may encounter, as opposed to just giving them um, the radiation continuously over seven days. So that's one of the primary reasons. Now, there are cases where patients have um, life threatening situations. If their spinal cord is being compressed, if one of the major vessels are being compressed, then we don't give them a break in the radiation. And sometimes we even have them treated twice per day. Is there any way that you can, or work being done to eliminate the noise in the MRI machine? That's a question for Lori. <laughs> Noise is good. It's those at, uh, the, the atoms are moving, the molecules and whatnot. I know it's. I understand that, but you know you can. They can put earplugs in to help with that. It, the resolution on those images are priceless. Remember, I know it's long. It takes a long time. It's noisy, but myself being in imaging for 32 years, I just love the quality of those pictures. Remember what we're trying to do. I ask for your patience, please, while you're in there. I empathize with you. I'm the one that goes in where they're testing stuff and I volunteer. So I go through it a lot more before you do. Um, but we have to find it so we can fix it. And to find it, we need to get those CTs, MRIs, and the PET scans for the positron emission tomography that we're um, doing some assessments to see how well things are working with chemo and radiation. I just asked for your patience, but the image quality that's happened thanks to computers over the decades is priceless. And it's helping you so we can do it the best that can be done. So, earplugs. And they can put music on too, a lot of them. If 
you knew the science and the physics that's going on behind that noise, like I love all that stuff because it's the output, the quality, so we can find it and fix it? I have one question. Okay, I have a question. The question is concerning early detection of cancer. Uh, we've heard a lot of very promising Would it be possible information to about treatment, but what, what is the status right now for people who do not have cancer, don't know about it yet, detecting it? Um, I would say that it really depends on the type of cancer. There are various screening programs that are available depending on the cancer and depending also if there's what we call an environmental um, component to, to, uh, to developing the cancer. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, sometimes all cancers are lumped together. We talk about cancer in general, but they're actually, as you know, cancers are dependent on the, the, the organ of origin. And even within the organ of origin, so let's talk about prostate or breast cancer. We know even, among all breast cancers, all prostate cancers, there are different types of, 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 of cancers. Um, a younger woman who's in her 30s has a different type of breast cancer than a woman who is in her 70s or 80s. A young man who's 40 has a different type of prostate cancer than one who's 90. So the screening for those types of people are very different. Some require genetic screening, where we draw blood and we analyze their DNA. Some require um, mam mammographic screening. Some require blood tests such as a PSA. But to answer your question, it really depends on the type of cancer. Um, there's screening for uh, skin cancers. Um, we're about to start, which I will um, ask Lord to speak about, which I think is phenomenal. And we're the only um, uh, center that's doing it in this entire year, screening for lung cancer. Um, as you know about the screening for prostate cancer, mm -hmm. there is screening for colorectal cancer with um, testing your stool for blood. Um, but not all cancers can, can be screened because some, we just don't have the, the technology in 2014. Um, but for lung cancer, um, something very, very important and very, very cutting edge is being started. I'll have Lord speak about that. So at, at St. Joe's, we've been developing a, a lung cancer screening program for quite some time. It's ready to go. We're launching it right now. And what it is, is we've engineered and designed the program to have a two-prong approach. The first level one is if they are high risk for lung cancer, and there's criteria for that, and that would be someone who has smoked uh, a net 30 pack a day total formula, if you looked at all that, or even a 20 pack a day. So you're at high risk because you smoked, right? And so then what we're gonna do is that we will draw your blood with a special lab that we have an alliance with. They can tell, test it, it'll take two weeks, and that will um, identify if there's an elevation in one of the several autoantibodies that we have in our blood. If there is one or more indicator where it shows there is an elevation, then we're gonna get you in for uh, a CT lung screening. Remember the slices of bread? So they're gonna be you know, thick slices of the lungs. Then the radiologist will read that, and then if we see something in there, then what do you think we're gonna do? It begins with a B. What are we gonna do? Biopsy it. Yes, we have wonderful <laughs> interventional radiologists. Then we'll know what the, what's in that lobe, and we'll, it'll be identified by the pathologist. They'll stage it, and then we're gonna make a plan. We're gonna make a plan, we're gonna fix it, right? We, fought, we found it, we're gonna fix it. There isn't anything we can't fix nowadays. We're in a great time to be alive, I think, compared to, uh, to treat it. And the wonderful thing is that it'll keep the cost down for society, for our patients, for everyone. Because the sooner we find something, the more efficiently we can fix it and the less cost. So that we're very excited about that. Okay. Uh, Doctor, excuse me, Doctor, sorry, Doctor Chaper. I just want to say that uh, since you belong to the Computer Club, you know that we usually talk about email viruses, uh, new software programs, and stuff like that. We don't talk about this. This has been one of the most fascinating Computer Club meetings I think that we've had. And one witness to that is the fact that it's 10:30 and nobody has left. <laughs>